Hello, everyone. This is Travis from Piebald, and you are listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. We're back. We're back two times in a week. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. Welcome to a special bonus episode of The New Scene. And our guest on today's show is Chad Johnson, creator of Furnace Fest. That conversation is coming up momentarily. It's great. We get into Chad's history. We get into the formation of Furnace Fest. We get into how the fest came about again, what to expect this year, some of the highlights from last year's fest. And I asked Chad the weirdest thing he's ever seen at Furnace Fest, and he tells us about that too. So stick around for that. That's coming up in a second. Here's how you can support us, the new scene, Apple Podcast Reviews. I've got to get us over 100. I've got to. So if you enjoy the show, open your Apple Podcast application, hit the five-star button, and leave a nice review. If you write a nice review, I'll read it on the show. And shirts. We have shirts available at the Death Wish Inc. store. Search the new scene. The shirts will pop up. We've got a long sleeve option. We've got t-shirt options. Wear it to Furnace Fest. Represent. You have to. You just have to. And don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. Check them out on Instagram at Iodine Recordings or at their website at iodinerecords.com. Iodine will have a booth at this year's Furnace Fest. Come by. Say hi. I will be there at various times throughout the weekend. Pick up some iodine merch, including the new scene shirts. We'll have them there. We will have them there. And I've got a music recommendation for you. You have to check this out. The band is Trauma Ray, and the song is Trauma Ray. It looks like Trauma Ray, but spelled differently. They have an EP out, Transmissions. It came out this year. Check it out. Good 90s sounding alternative post-hardcore type stuff. You know I love it. It sounds very hum. It even sounds like filter in some points. I dig it. I dig it. I put a track on our new scene Spotify 2022 playlist. You can hear the band there or just check them out on the streaming service of your choice. So there you go. Make sure you check back in with me in segment three. I'm going to do a full Furnace Fest deep dive. I'm going to look at the line up from day to day. I'm going to tell you who I'm most excited to see, and I'm going to give you some helpful tips for navigating the fest. But right now, we are going to speak to the man behind the festival himself, Chad Johnson. Enjoy. We're here now with Chad Johnson. Chad, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Keith. This is awesome. I'm loving it already. I mean, I've, we haven't really even said or done anything, and it's already great. So we're good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I'm happy to hear you say that. And I'm happy you're here, Chad, because, you know, Furnace Fest is back. Yeah. It's exploding. We've got one in the pocket. We've got another one coming up. I imagine you are incredibly busy <laughs> most of the year, especially right now. And look, we're going to get to all that and cool. dig into your past so I can get to know you a little better. But first, Chad, let me ask you, how are you doing today? Yeah, thanks, Keith. I appreciate you asking. Uh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm not living a stress-free existence uh, as it relates to, to festivals. I mean, uh, you know, you. I'm sure as you're aware and as anyone listening is aware, the the climate, you know, the climate last year for Furnace Fest, bringing it back after 17 years was global pandemic, multiple postponements, uh, va- vaccine, you know, requirements and, uh, and, and stipulations and just challenges of like one sort. And now this year, it's like, it's like everything's crazy expensive. The, the world economy is falling apart. There's war. It's like, man, I, I don't know that I picked the right season <laughs> to start Furnace Fest back, but it was always kind of a crazy uh, experience. So I guess, I guess it's fitting. <laughs> this is, I think this is just the world now. Yeah. So there's true. never going to be a good time. We just got to roll with it. I know, dude. I, I, I'm going to take that to heart. I, I'm going to get that printed on a shirt. There's never going to be a good time. Furnace Fest is rolling with it. Seriously. Exactly. That is great. Thank you. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I went last year. It was my first time there since 2003. Oh, man. And I was blown away, you know, walking wow. in there and, and all these mem- memories come flooding back sure. and just, you know, I think it's, uh, well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to circle back to all that, okay, Chad, because okay. I've, got, I've got a lot of questions about the fest, but sure. I want to get to know you a little bit first. Where did you grow up? So I grew up, uh, I'm originally from Chicago, so Chicago's suburbs, and uh, when I was like seven, my parents moved to the Caribbean, so I lived in the Caribbean for uh, nine, I guess nine years, and then I moved to South America, so I, I've lived all over. Um, I was Wow, in- so you're telling me you moved from... <laughs> Chicago yep. to the Caribbean. Yeah, to, to, to South America. I mean, it's like I got the upgrade of all upgrades from Chicago winters to Caribbean, just <laughs> epic, you know, tropical beauty. What do your parents do? Are they military or something? No, they're they're missionaries. So well they were. So my, my dad passed away a few years ago, but um but yeah, they were Christian missionaries, so which which was uh its own sort of funny thing, especially as a a guy a, a young kid who didn't have any interest in uh anything other than skateboards, Metallica and marijuana. But, uh, <laughs> but it was, you know, it, it, was, it was, it was an upbringing that I would never trade, um, for anything. And, uh, ironically, I'm now a, a Christian as well, but it, it came, that all kind of came about very unexpectedly. And, uh, I, it was, yeah, the, but the, the experience living in the Caribbean was, was just unreal. Uh, South America too, but growing up overseas was a very, Oh, it's a very cool, very, very um, other. Well, otherworldly is like like duh. Like of course it was otherworldly. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it was it was unique on a level that uh yeah that I, I don't think um I can't yeah I can't really even like put into words. It's just amazing as I think back and uh, how much has happened and like wow I used to live in the Caribbean. That is that is wild. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. What is it like on these missionary? Voyages. I imagine like a village, and your, yeah. your parents are are in robes and like teaching people. What's what's the reality? The funny thing about my parents and the work they were doing. My dad was an electrical engineer, and he used to repair. Like I think his first job out of college or out of uh, his educational experience was um, repairing amplifiers, like guitar amps, at a at a little like seventies shop somewhere. I don't know where Chicago, uh, and and so it was. It was interesting because he continued that line of like kind of carried that whole electronic. Uh, so it was they actually worked for a radio station, and so he was he was responsible for making sure that all the electrical equipment was functioning, and it was a lot of. Uh, I just remember like soldering, so- soldering, yeah, soldering irons and. Um, just a lot of funny tools and like weird, weird stuff uh, in his office. But yeah, it was, it was wild. So you were not into the Christian lifestyle, it sounds like when you were a young man. I was into the the free living lifestyle or the <clears throat> do whatever I kind of want lifestyle. And, um, uh, but yeah, but I did, uh, I ended up, I guess when I was living in, in South America, I got into quite a bit of trouble after I began dealing in a, I, I would argue a very light dosage of uh, passing drugs along to under underage children at my school, and they didn't they didn't really appreciate that so much, and the local authorities didn't didn't think it was very cool what I was doing. So there were uh, I I just came to a point where I sort of hit a wall in life, and that was that was the catalyst for me throwing having my you know quote come to Jesus moment, just kind of throwing the the arms of my life up and like, this, I, I give up. Like if I don't believe in you, I, th- I think that everything that I've heard about you is just not, uh, not for me. But if there's anything here, then I really, I, I don't have anything else. So please help. You know, like one of those, kind of, like a Hail Mary kind of, kind of prayer, uh, we, we might call it. And so from, from that point, I've, I've sort of very, I would argue very, um, awkwardly and and very not not i've never been the most committed but very uh somehow i've just found myself still enamored by the story of jesus and and faith in jesus and so yeah furnace fest actually comes out of all of that and and my desire to see people um experience a side of of christianity that maybe maybe they they didn't get or maybe maybe just like a a taste 
of what I wasn't seeing in the South at that time and uh, trying to break down some barriers and break down some walls that were preventing people on both sides of the fence from seeing each other for the the, the beautiful, valuable people that, that we are. How old were you when you had that realization after getting into the trouble? Uh, I was maybe like 18 or 18-ish, maybe going on 19. So up until that point, were you just struggling and unhappy and kind of... No, I was pretty stoked, actually. No, I was, I, I, <laughs> I was pretty excited. I mean, I was very... Uh, I had a team. I had a crew. I didn't have a team. That makes it sound like I was a football player. I had a. I had a gang. I had a tribe. But maybe that's the better way of putting it. Uh, I had people around me that were just uh, also into the same same thing: music and drugs and uh, partying and just uh, li- living this crazy life in South America. And uh, no, I loved it. it. But it wasn't until I sort of lost all of that and uh, all my friends were overnight shipped out of country because of this little drug operation that we had been running and uh, the local authorities had had caught wind of it uh, no no pun intended and uh, and they they were gonna they were gonna incarcerate us for um, 10 years without without trial or without uh, question so it was a pretty serious uh, issue that at the time as a as a teenager I don't think I really understood but um yeah, thankful, thankful that I didn't have to live live those years in a in a prison. So there would have been some pretty serious consequences had you not made a change. It sounds like. Yeah, yeah, I think there would have been. Yeah, that yeah, that's interesting. You know, it's like um, I I see some parallels. You know, I uh, I'm just impressed that you made that choice at 18 years old because I didn't decide to get my shit together until I was 35. So I continued the party for much, much longer. <laughs> no, I get it, man. I get it. I've, uh, I, there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole other, there's all kinds of other stuff we could get into that, uh, that I've had many, many turns in life that I am not proud of or, or would have done very differently now looking back. But, but I'm yeah. thankful, you know, I'm thankful for the, the opportunities and the experiences for sure. Talk about you're 18 years old. You decide to turn your life around. Now, talk about discovering punk rock, hardcore, whatever it is you were into. I mean, you you have some things on your resume. You were co-founder of Take Hold Records. You did A&R for Tooth and Nail. Talk about uh, discovering that scene and kind of working into all that. I, I guess around the time that I had gone through my my sort of troubled uh, tr- troubled legal and uh crazy south american stuff i moved back to chicago with my family and uh and i went uh, because i had had this like conversion experience and i had become a christian i i was trying to find music that was anywhere near as exciting as the dead milkmen or Nirvana, or Metallica, or the the Beatles, Pink Floyd, you know, like anything I was I was listening to that would uh, improve my drug experience, and uh, and Metallica just improved my life overall. Not no drugs required, but every everything else was kind of <laughs> drug related. But um, <laughs> but I walked into this like little Christian bookstore, and I thought this is like this place is so f- weird. Like I've never been to a place like this where there's just like little, little like trinkets of like faith, faith kind of trinkets. And, uh, but they had a music section and I was like, Oh, this is, this is interesting. And I can remember s- just finding or coming across records that l- didn't look Christian. They didn't look religious. They didn't look, um, spiritual. They, they just looked like cool album art. And so I, um, I began to sort of uncovering the world of music that was kind of, that was underground within starting with the Christian side of things. And, uh, and then I, and then by the time I had, I was, I guess, living in Birmingham and had, had recently gotten married, I was just enamored by music. And I just loved that there was this underground scene and that there were there were bands uh like avail and hot water music that would that would come to town and discount and uh jimmy world and at the drive-in and all, all these all these bands that i would i continued to uncover th- that just helped me realize that there was a bigger move within this small kind of subset of music and it just felt like this was 
this was about to take off. Like, this is there's something here, and uh, there whether it's Revelation Records or Victory Records or Equal Vision or any number of labels that were around Tooth and Nail, it just felt like there was a lot bubbling, bubbling over, bubbling up. But yeah, it was it, it was just like jumping. I, I don't really don't know how to do anything in life without jumping all in. So I just jumped in and went to as many shows as I could, listen to as many CDs. Unfortunately, back then, most of it was, I did, a, I did a little vinyl, but most of it was CD. Yeah, that was, I remember that being a big thing when I got into hardcore. I'd be like, how many CDs do you have? <laughs> oh, I only have 50. Oh, that's it. It was like a thing. Well, uh, show me, show me your, your, uh, flap folder you know book of cds <laughs> and let's go through them together I'm like no way you like texas is the reason to oh wow you like gorilla biscuits you know it's like <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden there you know there's a connection that forms even if i only had 50 cds <laughs> <laughs> so you're discovering this music you're going to shows what comes next i i guess i had started a little distribute i don't know di- like ba- i don't know if you remember back in the day distros were were kind of a thing oh, of course where, yeah you could order mail order um different merch from artists i mean this was obviously before the internet had really become uh the thing and uh so i, I had started a little distro where i would show up at shows and set up a booth in the back with some cds and some t-shirts and I don't know, maybe a, some skateboard parts and Star Wars toy. It was really random, really, really bizarre. It was kind of like a flea market for under underground punk hardcore uh, emo music, and uh, and I and and I just realized that that I I like that, and I was like, this is fun. And so then I opened a little, a little record store where I I was able to put that stuff up on shelves and people would very occasionally come in and, and be like, wow, this is a weird store. It's got a little bit of everything, (laughs) but, but then that, that kind of turned into a, um, a music venue. And I started seeing these bands come through town that were unsigned and, and just full of potential from, in my opinion. And I couldn't believe that people weren't, weren't weren't like they weren't actually already part of a bigger structure or system and so i just decided i got to start a record label cuz that sounds cool you know like i own a record label and uh, but i had no idea what i was doing i studied psychology in college i i didn't really even finish college i wanted to get married and my wife lived in birmingham i i left school moved to birmingham i was i was just impassioned and uh, I didn't really want to work for two men in a truck, which was the the moving company I was working with straight out of college. And so I yeah. thought if I could, you know, if I could start a label and if I could do this music thing, but uh, yeah, so it just, it just sort of morphed into a part of my life and, and an, a extension of my heart to Birmingham by way of, of, teaming up with other people in the scene, but also uh, just, just trying to, uh, try, trying to, to understand like how it all worked because, uh, it was all, it was still, you know, it wasn't like I went to school for this or I, I hadn't been for years and years just like, Oh man, I, I lived in a super incredible, you know, I was in New York city or I was in Boston or I was in Miami or I was in some city where, where this kind of thing was just uh, the norm, but um, it, it it's it's almost like it found me is sort of how it I, I feel it happened. It, once it finds you, then then you're part of it, you know, uh, regardless of who you are or where you're at or what you're doing or uh, you know what you want to do. It's like all right, now you're a part of it, and so I just wanted to I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted and I wanted to contribute. I wanted to get to know people. I wanted to understand why why some of my friends were vegans and why they were straight edge and why they were atheists and why, you know, like wh- why were people choosing very different paths than the one I was on and what was kind of, so I, I actually developed a incredible appreciation for tofu in that season. And uh, <laughs> to this day, man, I would, I'll kill some tofu any place, anytime, any place, anywhere, especially if it involves Asian food, you know, like it, just like a, a great Asian restaurant with tofu. It's like, ah, oh, man. So it's funny how like now looking back conversations after a show or before a show 
or hanging out with people that were also promoting concerts in uh, in town. And it was just, you know, for them, being vegan was really was was really significant. And so uh, it, it was just, yeah, it was just like, oh, of course we're going to go to the 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 buffet you know like the chinese restaurant buffet and <laughs> go crazy yeah, i remember that being a thing yeah 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 it was like a vegan they had a vegan chinese restaurant buffet and it was it was so exciting it's like every week we we had to go do that so <laughs> that's one thing i like about this scene is that it made me very open minded like i came in very closed minded about everything but Shortly thereafter, you know, I discovered what veganism is and vegetarian vegetarianism, you know, like you're describing and all the music, like I discovered all the tooth and nail stuff, Zayo, Overcome, bands like this. And even though I wasn't religious, I really appreciated the music and I was just, I was just into everything. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's incredible because I, I feel like that is the power that exists in, in the music is that you can... Yeah you can appreciate it and that was the kind of the core idea behind furnace fest is what would it look like to bring together a lot of different styles and a lot of different kinds of bands whether whether that was stylistically or whether that was belief structure or or anything else and, and what would it look like to have them spend a weekend together uh take hold records co-founder yeah. you are yes i no. I, well technically i was the founder i wish that there was a co-founder because that would have probably saved me a lot of time money and energy but uh the there was not there was not another person involved other than friends that would help and that would um ship out help me ship out cds and merchandise and come to shows and drive around and it was but yeah it was a uh, man take hold was the it was the first time that I realized that maybe I had potential in music. And it was also the first time I realized that I was in way over my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, especially doing everything yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. Without mostly uh, yeah, yourself. But, yeah. Mostly myself without any real backing, without any idea of how business uh, or, or entrepreneurial kind of um, mindsets work. Or, uh, I, I mean, yeah, I just didn't know. I didn't know anything uh, other than I loved seeing these bands and hearing these bands that would come through and uh, felt like they they deserved support, and I wanted to try to offer that. Didn't Take Hold put out the the Hopes Fall EP? No wings yeah. to speak of. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, that, that's a classic. I know it is. Thanks. I, I, I still years later listen to that EP, and I'm just like, Man. same here. Yeah, I'm like, what a. <laughs> What like all oh, for us for a little record with four songs? These songs pack such a punch. There's nothing like them. No, you know true. it. It has that early. It has that late '90s melodic metalcore sound, but it's just like it's its own thing. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. So, did founding Take Hold Records push you into uh, doing A and R for Tooth and Nail? It did. It kind of. It's like it opened the door for that because it was kind of like Take Hold Records afforded me the luxury of being able to showcase what I was doing and what I was working on in, in a in a way that looked pretty like the the records uh looked nice or they sound some of them not all of them but some of them actually sounded pretty good some did not sound <laughs> very good but but I think I think for tooth and nail it was it was enough of a presentation for them to see that there was some potential there and that what I was doing seemed to be connecting with people. So as an A&R person, you were responsible for seeking out new talent and signing, getting them signed to the label? Yes, exactly. So who were some of the bands you got on? So, oh man, uh, some of the bands that came with me, some of the take hold bands under oath would have been the, the, the one to go uh, to sort of like go I don't know, immeasurably farther than any of us would have ever imagined uh, <laughs> from the days, you know, of, of, of them playing my little tiny venue in Birmingham to hardly any people. Um, and um, a band called 238 that was, that's still to this day, one of, one of my personal favorites and a, and a Furnace Fest uh, alumni artist uh, came with me and, and several other artists came with me to Tooth and & Nail. And then, um, there were bands like Further Seems Forever and Me Without You, 
uh, Stretch Armstrong, that because I had relationship with them, once I got to Tooth and Nail, it, it, it just kind of worked out timing wise for me to take those bands on as A and R, and then bands like like Beloved or He Is Legend or The Chariot or Showbread were were bands that uh, that I ended up signing. Uh, ba- a band like Anne Berlin was kind of caught in the middle because I knew them most, not all, but most of these bands I knew from the the Birmingham, the Furnace Fest, Take Hold. Uh, shows in town kind of thing. So it wasn't, uh, it was just like, I, I didn't realize that at the time, but it turned turned out that I just had a slew of connections in my back pocket, so to speak, that were all r- really gifted, really talented a- and free agents. So uh, so it was like, oh, well, man, I, I, I now work for a label and they actually know what they're doing and they've got real financial backing. So maybe we could do something here. And, uh, and it just what like grew beyond anything I could have, I could have ever envisioned. Yeah. It's like the, the wave is cresting up and exactly. you're just uh, caught up in the right exact time. Exactly. It was just that, like music that the whole underground scene at that time was just like, it was just like cascading into this volcano, uh, of, a of, a you know, uproar. And, and it was just like everywhere you turned you were hearing about bands that were either on some tour that you wouldn't have expected or they're on a radio station or they're they're they did crazy numbers it was just all of a sudden like man thrice is they're like a they're like a big band or uh fallout boys on the radio you know just like it was just so so wild like like the in even the heavier bands were just all, all of a sudden becoming very very popular uh, and it almost, it didn't, it did not happen overnight, but it kind of felt like it did. Cause it just was like this slow progression. You don't really notice it all that much. And then all of a sudden you look around and it's like, Whoa, ev- everywhere I look, there's some artists doing something really amazing and being supported and being appreciated and being cherished. And, um, and it just, yeah, start was growing. Um, and didn't didn't seem to stop. No, no, and I, I feel like that's happening again. I don't know if it's just because uh, I have renewed interest these days. Not that I ever like stopped, but you know, sure. I'm I'm more in the mix now. But I feel like there's exciting things happening again. Oh no, absolutely, there there are, and uh, and I think that Furnace Fest is just one example of the kind of cyclical uh, historical tw- twenty year cycles that happen uh, that that especially i think in culture where whatever was kind of the thing 20 years ago it comes back around and all of a sudden it's like oh man it's enough time has passed that i need to i need to like go listen to that record again or i need to consider uh that memory or or uh putting on that t-shirt or whatever it is and um I was, yeah, I, I was, I've been blown away by how much the music scene is just continuing to to take off in some, some ways, like very similar to what it was, but then in other ways, completely different. Thanks that, yeah. Thanks to the internet. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about Furnace Fest. When did it start? How did you conceive it? Talk about the early days. Sure. Um, yeah, 2000 was was the first ever Furnace Fest. There were four, um, so you were you would have been at the last Furnace Fest of the original bunch. So 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, and um, and I just ha- as a local Birmingham promoter, I had uh, I had a lot of bands that I was working with, many of whom were Christian and some of whom were not. And then I was friends with other promoters who were working with just sort of regular bands. And it was kind of a combination of, of like, I would love to just bring people together and spend a weekend together with no agenda for trying to not manipulate too strong of a word, but influence them with my faith. Like, hey, I'm bringing everyone here for a free meal, but really like <laughs> it, there's a bit of a bait and switch at the end. Cause I need you to listen to my 30 minute presentation about, uh, you know, like a, uh, a, a resort 
um, condo you should yeah you don't want it to be like a timeshare right yeah. exactly it's like oh wait I thought I was just getting free steak and it's like nope sucker <laughs> you know so <laughs> I, I didn't want Furnace Fest to be that I just wanted it to be a, a, a genuine gathering of people that were all very similar but all very different and for everyone to have a, a, a voice and everyone to have a space and everyone to have an opportunity to express themselves and to share how they saw the world and in hopes that maybe maybe there would be something really beautiful that came from that. Um, and of course, you know, from, from my side, as a follower of Jesus, of course, I want people to see a side of my story, but not at the expense of of um, uh, minimizing theirs or, or discrediting theirs or like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to hear about anything that Keith feels, believes, thinks, or desires. I just want to talk about me, you know? And it's like, well, <laughs> clearly yeah. we would, we would uh, call that arrogant, uh, arrogance and, uh, you know, probably narciss narcissistic and other things. But, but anyway, it just kind of, the festival on, so on, on that front, like more on the social front, I wanted to bring people together of differing uh, sort of opposing sides. And then I also wanted to give the the bands on take hold an opportunity to play with other bands in, in hopes that maybe friendships would be formed and maybe tours would happen. Maybe collaborate collaborations would take place. But again, not, not out of a, like, you know, let me see if, if uh stairwell can, can talk to newfound glory and let me like sit them down at a, at a like coffee table and introduce them. And it's all awkward. And we, you know, it's just like maybe organically something would come from this that would, that would be a help to the bands that I worked with and help lend them some, some exposure. That's a, that's the perfect way to do it because you are in a unique position where you can bring everybody together, but you don't have to do anything else. Yeah. Like everybody's together and you can just let the rest happen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's that's always been the vision, that's always kind of been my my hope for for the festival is just if I could bring people together then we can all sort of sort out where it goes from there. And I I think I've always seen Furnace Fest uh through maybe the lens of uh, of the table analogy where uh where we're seated at uh, a humongous table and everybody brings something to this table that they, that they appreciate, that they really enjoy, that they really love. And, um, and it doesn't mean you have to try everything or you have to consume everything or, you know, you have to tell everybody, uh, you know, you have to give them um, praise for something that, that you may not agree with or appreciate, but, but at least we're, we're sitting at the same table, you know, and we're, we're, um, we're having conversation and we're enjoying each other's company. And so, um, yeah, so it's been, it's been, it's been really kind of wild to watch Furnace Fest transform from the original days of uh, being very, very, as you would have remembered, uh, just unorganized DIY, uh, super, um, super fun, but, but very, what's the word? Not, not naive, maybe naive, maybe a combination of naive, but also just unassuming, I, I think is maybe the, the best word where it just, we, we weren't trying to be cool. We weren't trying to, to be better. We weren't trying to compete. We weren't trying to, we were, we were just trying, trying to do our own thing and, and let the festival do the talking. Exactly. We were just doing what we do. You know, I right. had been to Hellfest and well, I guess that's the only other hardcore fest I'd been to at the time. And then I was on tour with a friend's band and we went to Furnace Fest and it was incredible. I still think that's the best uh, festival venue. I mean, what could be yeah, better than I that? It's so, the grounds <laughs> are so cool. Yeah, they are. Especially for a for a heavy music festival you know like <laughs> it's uh All it's industrial like, and right the, right it's just it's like uh i don't know there's a lot of metal jokes that i'm sure have uh have been made <laughs> that uh, <laughs> uh involving for its lost furnaces but but you're right it's just it's such a unique weird um beautiful setting that when you then pair it with artists that are really unique beautiful and uh 
exceptional at, at, at their art. It's like, man, it's, it's a cool, it's a really sweet combination. So the festival has always been at Sloss Furnace Grounds, yes? Correct, yes. So how, are you able to book that pretty easily? It seems like it would be hard to get. No, it's, I mean, thankfully they uh, operate the, f- the furnaces now as both historic landmark, but also as a, um, as a, as a venue. So you could rent it for uh, a wedding for uh, any, pretty, pretty much any kind of event you could hypothetically um, use it. So, so it's actually meant to be used in this way. Uh, and it, it's hosted other festivals, other uh, concerts and stuff fairly regularly. So it's not, it's actually not as quite as weird as maybe it seems. It's just, Odd because there, as far as I know, there's not many cities that have structures like this with events also taking place, uh, you know, within them. The original run of the fest went until 2003. Why did we stop in 2003? Yeah, at that point, I I was working full time in Seattle for Tooth and Nail, and I had been, I guess, working at Tooth and Nail for two, maybe two years, and I just it, it was just too much. Uh, there was no way for me to be both a and r guy spending time investing in artists and trying to help grow their careers while also trying to keep a festival going that was on the other side of the country and uh it, it just was it just was too much um and so it it was one of those things where it was kind of even though tooth and nail never told me this they never came out and said it it was i just felt like i, I intuitively knew like they they're okay with me doing this like as a final kind of thing. I think maybe I was already planning the 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 last one or the second to last one or something and and it was sort of part of the arrangement, but um it just became appa- super apparent to them that I wasn't capable of multitasking very well. And so <laughs> it was either all festival or all to the nail bands, not not both and. So it ends in 2003. What happened all of those years? How long were you living in Seattle and working for Tooth and Nail? Yeah, I was with Tooth and Nail until uh, um, 2009. And uh, then I, I left the music industry completely and I went off into a kind of like spiritual Jesus following nonprofit um, ser- service kind of kind of still tied with artists and, and creatives uh, I basically went and just started my own little thing again. That's uh, I feel like throughout my life I've just I just seem to like find myself starting little things that sort of limp along for a while and may, maybe they they work for a little bit and then either something else comes up or something happens and uh, it was so for maybe I guess about ten years um, I just committed myself to. What I think I had always hoped to do in in music, which was somehow really take my faith seriously, and it was kind of like saying, like, like if I'm going to call myself a follower of Jesus, then I want to actually understand what that means, and I want to try to apply myself in the best way I can. And that's not to say I did it well or or consistently, but that was that was my my ambition anyway, and my my hope was to. Uh, to, to do that. So I, I, I completely walked away from anything conventional music. I wasn't in the, in the music industry. I wasn't selling, you know, anything. I wasn't working with, with artists in any kind of business form. And, and I had a friend who used to come to shows that I put on in, in Birmingham. And I would see him often when I would come to Birmingham because my wife um, still has family there in, in the city and almost we 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 love this coffee shop called Octane Coffee and so we would almost every trip go into Octane and my friend Johnny was almost always at this Octane and i kind of knew like if i go to birmingham and i go to octane most likely johnny's going to be there cuz i always bump into him <laughs> there so i bumped into him and and like at, um, probably i don't know if it was every time but most times he would be like hey man like let's do let's do furnace fest you know let, let, let's bring furnace fest back uh, and I just like thought he was crazy, you know, like, no way, man. That That's like, like, do you, do you know how much work that is? Like, do you know how much financial risk that is? Do you know how, how hard that is? Uh, and, um, 
but he just kept at it. And so a couple of years ago, I saw him again and he's like, Hey, it's, it's about to be the 20th anniversary. Like, I think we should really do this. And, uh, I said, man, I, I don't know. It's, uh, he said, I'll, I'll help and we'll, we'll just figure it out. And I said, okay. I'll, I'll think about it. And, um, and I just felt, you know, he said something like, you know, what if there's people that you only, you, you never get to see again here on earth, except for at Furnace Fest. And I was like, whoa, like, man, as a 40, as a 40, I guess then like a 46 year old, it, it, that, that hit me because I'm, I was now, it's like, I'd kind of entered into the second half of my life. A- and if by grace, I'm given that, that second half, you know, like, uh, it, it was, but it just kind of, I guess it just, maybe there, there's like a combination of an awareness and a humility that comes with age because y- you're not quite as young. You're not quite as agile. You're not quite as quick on your feet. And, and, uh, and so anyway, it just, it's like, yeah, it's like he pulled on some heartstrings that, uh, that caused me to think, yeah, this is, this is worth doing for those people that I, that I might not be able to hug, um, uh, apart from us doing this. So, so then it just became, uh, you know, then it just become a, a, became a fun challenge for like, what band could we potentially get back together? Who could we go after? You know, like how, how could we potentially do this? And we'd have to try to get as many of the original bands to be a part of it. You know, it just has to be, you know, the, the, the best we can, we can, we can do. So, yeah. I mean, uh, Johnny makes a, an interesting point because there are people that I saw at the fest who I would never see again if it weren't for the fest. Yeah, I, exactly. And, and that to me, that that's the value. That's the, well, it's not the only value, but in my opinion, it's the greatest value because it's, it's the friendship with others that social media and time on computers or phones just doesn't ever replace, um, as, as, you know, useful and, and, uh, you know, some sometimes um, good as those things can be. It uh, it's just n- not not the same as seeing an old friend and catching up over a s- watching hopes fall in the shed stage, or uh, <laughs> you know, getting a beer, or or eating food, or hanging out by the pond and listening to further seems forever, or you know, whatever whatever it is. So, uh, yeah, that's cool. It's cool to hear you say that. All right, so you decide to get this thing going again. Had you been in touch with the music? Like, did you know, okay, we need to get these newer bands and these older bands, or did you have to like play catch up a little bit? Oh man, I no, I was clueless. I totally had to catch up. I mean, thankfully, we were trying to bring back Furnace Fest as closely comparable to the originals with four years of inspiration to kind of fuel us. And, and so that part wasn't as hard. It wasn't like I forgot, like, oh, I, w- I wonder what, you know, this band, like, what, well, I wonder what Kill Switch Engage sounds like, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, you know, like, thank I mean, I still listen to music. I just wasn't nearly as involved and I, and I wasn't very clued in on what was happening in the scene now, or I didn't really know much about what was going on uh, around me. And so it did, it, it was a discovering a lot of new bands and just talking to people and listening. And someone would say, Oh, you got to check out this band better off, or you have to check out this band be well, or you have to check out this band, uh, the story so far, or, you know, all, all these, these bands that I'd never, never even heard of started coming up and I would just spend time listening like, Whoa, this is so good, man. Yeah, we have to try to get this band. It must be daunting to uh, try and book this thing. I mean, it was, yeah. On top of all the bands that are out there, I imagine you just get flooded with requests as well. Yeah, yeah, no, we did, and and thankfully, a lot of those requests were actually great, and and from bands like the Juliana Theory um, or As Friends Rust, or th- there were just a lot of bands that heard about the festival and said, hey, we just heard this is happening. We'd love to play it. And so th- it kind of made made our job really easy. And uh, and thankfully, there were two, maybe three of us working uh, on booking it. So it wasn't just exclusively on my shoulders to, uh, you know, to f- fulfill. How many people are involved with coordinating the fest? 
And I'm talking like uh, the the planning and all that. Sure, stuff. sure. There's four um, business partners that are that are active on a daily, sometimes hourly basis. And then there's probably I don't know, maybe like a team of twenty or so others that are that are highly involved in different aspects. Maybe ten, maybe maybe twenty is being a bit excessive. Um, it's, it's much, much bigger than that when, once it comes down to the actual day of, or the week of, but the advanced planning, there's, yeah, there's maybe a core of like 10 or so people that are pulling all this, all this stuff together. So let's talk about last year's Furnace Fest. Now we know it got pushed back a couple of years because of COVID, right? Correct. And that probably caused all kinds of havoc because of trying to book and rebook people and people dropping off and booking new people to take their place and all of that. It did. Yeah, it, it was it was frustrating and very challenging, but um, thankfully, and obviously not impossible and uh, not in the end, it sort of turned out beautiful, but... <laughs> It's not really, you know, like at the time it wasn't really, I, I guess uh, it wasn't as easy to see that beauty because everything was so, yeah, so challenging. Did you ever think like, oh, let's just scrap the whole thing? Because I mean, things were so unsure at the time. No one knew what the heck was going on or when things were going to open back up. No, absolutely. I had several times uh, where where I just kind of hit really dark spots and uh, and I just couldn't see it working. I, I felt like we were putting in all this time and all this effort only to get people excited for something that ultimately we were going to let them down with. It was really, yeah, it was really tough because it just, um, it just felt like we, we were almost delaying the inevitable where it was like, this thing's not going to happen. We should just be honest about that and let it go. Um, but thankfully the time, through the pandemic really afforded us opportunities to add in another stage to br- bring in many additional artists like there, there was just a lot we were able to do that otherwise would not have been the case absolutely and i'm glad the fest happened because i was there last year and i thought it was fantastic i thought it was Thank you. really well set up really well organized and i i there's a ton more people right i don't remember yeah. there being that many people in 2003 no no in 2003 it was it was uh probably around 2500 people and last year was cl- i mean i think it was 9000 or some something like that yeah it was considerably bigger so how do you feel like the fest went what are your thoughts? Oh, it's, I mean, uh, b- way better than I could have ever anticipated. Way, way better. I mean, the, the, I just think it was a combination of how long it had been since some of these bands had performed, plus the pain of a global pandemic and the uncertainties and the issues and, and it's the heartache and stuff that came with that. It just, I feel like ev- it just almost was like everyone was able to let out a collective sigh of relief. <laughs> like, ah, like, man, we're all here. We've all made it through somehow. These bands are about to be playing. The merch lines are, are super long, but who cares? We're, we're just here again and Astronoids you know, playing in the background, even though we'd rather be watching them up close. It it was just kind of, it just felt like, like nothing could really go wrong because we'd already been through such a difficult chapter of our lives. And, uh, and I don't, I don't think that that, I I don't think we'll ever be able, hopefully we'll never be able to replicate that. Uh, hopefully we won't ever have to because we, you know, we don't just start living in global pandemic mode, but, um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but but yeah it was so i came away from it so like the level of support the level of excitement the level of appreciation the level of connection that i felt i mean was better than any other furnace fest combined all four combined was um was, was so special it was just meant so much and uh it's it's the reason why we decided to do it again. Like it, the the response was so strong that we were like, okay, this this feels like there's more there's more happening here than just a uh, 
a, a one-off kind of thing. Yeah, I felt it too. I walked away from that weekend super happy. And I went through such a wide range of emotions. You know, I'm 40 years old now. I went from, I can't do this anymore. I can't stand all day. I'm too tired to, this is the best day ever to, <laughs> I'm tired again to, I don't yep. want to leave to, I'm ready to leave. It was, yep. you know, it was a roller coaster of emotions that I loved. Sure. No, I, I get that. And I think, I think all of those are very, very appropriate. Where are you during the fest? Are you just running around checking on things or do you have like your own secluded area? What's going on? No, no, I'm, I'm thankfully, uh, running. I'm not really running around checking on things. Thankfully, by the time the festival happens, all of that sort of stuff has been delegated and is in much more capable hands. I'm just able to be social, to be, to go watch bands, say hi to friends, hang out. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, of course there's occasionally something that comes up or there's like a staff meeting or a volunteer meeting or, you know, there's something that, that comes up, uh, that requires my attention. But for the most part, it, it's like, uh, do you want to go talk to this person you haven't seen in 20 years? Or do you, do you want to go see this band with them? Do you, you know, it's just kind of, it's, it's relatively similar to, I think everyone else's experience with the exception that I, I have a little laminate around my around my neck that allows me to, fl- you know, flash flash it at the security guards and somehow convince them that I belong backstage. You know, uh, it's, <laughs> do you get a special laminate that's like better than all the other ones? Yeah, there's a. There, it's called the Boss Pass, and it had a little it had a little Shiba Inu dog on it, or uh, uh, what are those things called? A, I'm, I'm thinking of the 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 cryptocurrency, but anyway, oh, it had the, a, the, Doge the Doge. Yeah, yeah, it had the Doge dog on it. It had the, the Elon Musk puppy on it. Um, but um, it, it was great. It was so funny because it was like the opposite of a serious kind of like you know all access. It was just like this is the dumbest thing ever. But could you flash that and just like walk into a food truck and grab a burger or something? No, no, to? no, that wouldn't work. They just look at me funny and be like, <laughs> "Pay up," you know. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yeah, you can't. You, there's some things you just can't get away with. <laughs> Favorite performance at last year's fest for you? Who was it? Favorite performance uh, was probably Showbread. Uh, I I don't know. There was there's so many so many uh, performances that blew my mind and that were so good. Um, but I think that one was special because my whole family, all four of us, were on stage for it, and it was the first time in years and years and years that we were on a stage together. Uh, last time I can remember would have been in, uh, at the gorge warp tour, the gorge watching under oath, uh, play. So it just felt like it was, it, it was just a beautiful moment. The thing I love most about the fest is just a variety of bands. Like uh, when I read the, I somehow didn't even comprehend the lineup until I got there. And then I would look <laughs> at the lineup day to day and I was like, how what what is like how is this happening <laughs> that's well thank you that's that was the hope you know like the uh, for us it really was how do we put together the the absolute dream lineup and uh you know how do we how do we make this happen in a way that helps people feel like they're living 20 years ago all over again, hopefully, you know, a little, uh, with, with, um, yeah, with, with a little more maturity and, a, and a little more appreciation for the finer things of life. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was, oh man, so, so fun. Do you ever worry that you'll run out of bands and like, you won't be able to book another fest? Now I know there's unlimited bands in the world, but like, even with this podcast, I'm like, what if I run out of bands to talk to? Like, what am I going to do? No, I, I, for sure. I mean, I, I think that even this year we've gotten some some comments from people that feel like we should have stuck with more of the bands from last year, or we should have uh, kept it more older bands and not included newer bands. Which part of you know, to me, part of why Furnace Fest worked originally was because we had so many up and coming artists. And so for me, it, it's really difficult to see Furnace Fest growing beyond last year 
if it doesn't include artists that are also current, you know, that are happening right now that are not necessarily reuniting or they're not, they're not coming, you know, coming together for the first time in five or 10 or 15 or 20 years, they regularly tour, you know, put out records, et cetera. So, uh, I, I think it's, but yeah, it's a part, one of the reasons and one of our hopes is that we would be able to continue Furnace Fest for a, a cycle of four years. And that would be a, a, an exact replica of the original. And so I don't, we don't share that publicly very often. And, and, uh, we're not, you know, not really trying to hide it, but we're not really trying to hype it either. Um, because it really is just one, like, let's see how this year goes and then decide based on how this year goes, how the next year is going to work out. But, um, but it really, it, part of it was how do we potentially book for, completely different festivals with some similarities and some overlaps without creating the the exact same festival year after year for four years. Yeah, what would be the point of that? I think I think the way you're doing it is right because I saw the lineup this year compared to last year and I said, okay, I will purchase tickets again. Like what's the point of having a fest if it's the same lineup every year? Right. Exactly. It just feels like like we kind of we t- we took a bit of a cheap I, I don't know like like we 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 could have we could have done things differently you know and instead we're like well this is what we know so we're just going to stick to it but but I, and i just feel i th- for me it's really important to share the festival and the experience of the festival with as many people as possible and and that's exactly you know that that gets me very very uh, excited. So yeah. Yeah, that's what i like about it is that it's newer bands, it's older bands uh, it's heavier bands, it's lighter bands, it's everything. It's not just one thing. That's what. That's why I think the fest stands out. And uh, it, it just happens to be like every band I've ever listened to on one show. So there you go. Weirdest thing you've ever seen happen at the fest. Oh, man. Weirdest thing I've ever seen happen. I think the weirdest thing was, was probably uh, us having hate breed and watching some kind of like skinhead neo-Nazis um, clashing with Godfrey youth from Atlanta. And, uh, and one of them, I, I didn't, I didn't know that they did this, but apparently they filled a sock with like rocks or pennies or like random hard objects. And one of the guys hit a skinhead in the, on the head during hate breed. And of course split, you know, split his scalp open and he had to leave and go get stitches. But, um, that, that was like one of, I don't know why that comes to me as like the weirdest, it, it, I guess it's just weird because it's so out of character, you know, like that, that kind of thing never there. That's like the one time I can think of something that was really not so much odd uh, in the bizarre kind of sense, but like odd for the festival. Like it, it, it was always so peaceful, so chill, uh, so relaxed. So to see like at, at a hate breed show, this like thing had like this tension and like all of a sudden it was like, whoa, this is like, so this is weird. This is so strange. But uh, yeah, because I don't remember a lot of violence there. Even no, the no, th- there wasn't. And uh, I'm so thankful for that. But uh, I'm going to I'm going to think on that some more. Maybe maybe I can I feel like I can come up with something better. But uh, but for some reason that was anyway, that's the one that came to me. And uh, I'll just do one more quick question. Do all the uh, local vegan and vegetarian restaurants send you a thank you card each year yes. after the festival? They send me they send me free tofu for uh, for you know for a, a few days. It's great. No, no, <laughs> man. They they the restaurants and the the local um, service industry in Birmingham loves Furnace Fest, and we love them. And and it just it's so cool to see people discovering how beautiful of a city and and how incredible the people of Birmingham are uh, beyond just you know Sloss furnaces itself so Birmingham has a lot to offer and it's it's fun seeing uh, me like just I would I would run into I'd go into a Starbucks which isn't representative of a local homegrown Birmingham shop but when you need coffee really fast that's where I was and and it's just like oh yeah there's like three other people from Furnace Fest here and every everywhere I go it's like oh Furnace Fest that was great I love it. Well, Chad, I appreciate what you do. I want to say thank you for coming on the show, and I'm looking forward to this year's fest. I will be there once again. Yeah, same. I can't wait to have you, and uh, thank you so much for including me here.
And there you have it, Chad Johnson. That was a great conversation. It was interesting to hear about the behind the scenes mechanics of the fest. And for those that have been there, you know that I, it, it's got to be a major undertaking. And I wasn't surprised how many people are working on it. There's a ton of people there. There's a ton of vendors there. There's a ton of bands there. The amount of coordination that it must take to put this thing on, it must take them all year. And you know, you heard Chad say it himself. He was working at Tooth and Nail and he couldn't do Tooth and Nail and the fest at the same time. I mean, the fest, the fest has to be an all year production. And uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it. I'm looking forward to going again this year. It's going to be another great lineup. So let's get into it. Let's do a full Furnace Fest play by play deep dive. I'm going to give you some helpful tips. We're going to take a look at the lineup. I'm going to tell you who I'm excited to see. Let's get into this. Let's get into it. Okay, so first of all, some tips for navigating the fest. Number one, if you're fair-skinned like I am, bring sunscreen. You're going to want it. You're outside a lot of the time. There's not a ton of shade. There is shade, but uh, there's usually people there, but you can find a space if you really need to. So bring sunscreen. Number two, bring something to sit on. A lot of the benches and other spots are taken up by people a lot of the time. If you don't have VIP, you might not necessarily have access to a bench or a seat or somewhere comfortable to sit. I brought a big scarf and I would just put that on the grass and plant myself there when I got tired. And I was able to find somewhere nice to sit using that formula at any point during the fest last year. So I would bring something to put on the grass to sit on if you don't want to get your clothes messed up. And that reminds me, number three, don't wear clothing that is too nice. I made the mistake of doing that last year. I wore my best pair of jeans. I brought my best jacket. It was hot during the day. So I was shoving my jacket into a backpack. And then by the time I got it home, it was all wrinkled and covered in sunscreen. My jeans were dirty from grass and dirt. Uh, Not the worst thing in the world. I washed them and everything was fine, but bring your uh, medium range clothing. And if the weather is anything like last year, it's going to be very hot during the day and pretty chilly at night. So I would recommend bringing a zip up hoodie or some type of secondary garment to wear at night. Oh, and last but not least, if you hate standing as much as I do. Now, I went last year with my friend Vadim Taver who has been on the show several times, and he said he wore insoles with his sneakers. And at first I thought, insoles? (laughs) But I wore boots. I wore Doc Martin boots to the fest, and by the end of day three, I could barely stand anymore. You're going to be on your feet a lot. Wear a comfortable pair of shoes, and if you're getting up there in age like I am, wear insoles. I'm getting insoles this year, and I am wearing sneakers, and I have no shame. All right, so let's take a look at the lineup. It's another great lineup this year. I can't wait to go. I'm going to tell you who I'm looking most forward to seeing day by day. I'm looking at the Friday lineup now. Oh my goodness. Okay. And a disclaimer before I start, the bands I name aren't the only bands I'm going to watch. There's always random surprise sets I catch that I love. There's always bands I've never seen before that I see and really like. This is just first glance things I want to see. Okay. Number one, Thrice. Never saw them. Would like to see them. Newfound Glory. Haven't seen them since 1999, I think. That would be cool. Quicksand. Quicksand I have not seen since 2017. That's going to be a must see. E-Town Concrete. I know if Tommy were here with me, he would agree that E-Town Concrete is a must see. Never saw them. Fiddlehead. I had Pat Flynn from Fiddlehead on the show. I've never seen Fiddlehead. I want to see Fiddlehead. Let's see, who else? Norma Jean? Open Hand. Open Hand was on the This Day Forward tour that I went on in 2002. I haven't seen them in forever. I'd like to see them again. And of course, Stretch Armstrong. I mean, come on, you have to. They're there. They've played every year of Furnace Fest. So that's Friday. And you know what? There's too many good bands to pick. I can't pick a single one that I want to see the most. So uh, all of those bands that I just named, that's what I want to see. Moving on to Saturday, there is a two-way clear tie 
in who I want to see the most. Sunny Day Real Estate. I went to the string of reunion shows they had in 2008. I don't remember any of it. It was a crazy night. I got unbelievably drunk before the show. I went out after the show to a bar where my friend was DJing. The last thing I remember was them opening a case of Miller High Life and popping the top off each one and pushing it across the bar. The next thing I know, I woke up around the block with police in front of me. I had been punched out. I'm guessing I said the wrong thing to the wrong person in my drunken state. And I started yelling for the cops to go chase the people. And the cops started yelling at me because I was yelling at him and clearly drunk. Disaster of a night. My eye was split. I looked like a mess. Crazy, horrible night, but pretty typical for the life that I used to live. Don't remember the show. Don't remember the Sunny Day Real Estate gig. Can't wait to see them again. Super, super excited for that. And Elliot. Elliot. I've never seen Elliot. Ever. And as Chris Higdon mentioned on this show, this will be the first time they're performing false cathedrals as you hear it on the record. And I have a lot of history and emotion tied up with that record. It's one of my favorites of all time. Can't wait to see it. Can't wait to see it. And Poison the Well. Poison the Well. Full opposite of December set, I think. I know they were going to do that last year. I think they're doing it this year. I'm pretty sure. Looking forward to that. Let's move on to Sunday. Another big day. Mastodon. Never saw them. Would like to see them. Descendants. Never saw them. Would like to see them. American Nightmare. We just had Wes on the show. It was great talking to him. I don't know if I've ever seen American Nightmare. I think I may have in Philadelphia at some point. My mind is foggy, but that's going to be a must-see. And Slow Crush. Slow Crush is going to be here. They are going to be in America. This is going to be my chance to see them. Have to. Just have to. And look, there's too many good bands to even name. So there you go. It's bound to be another very memorable weekend. I'm looking forward to seeing many of you there. It's going to be great. And let me check in with everybody. You know, it's been a minute since I've been alone with all of you here. Number one, the show is going great. I love it. It's awesome. Number two, still working on the new band. It doesn't have a name yet. We can't seem to agree on a name, no matter what we do. If you know any good band names, send them my way. I don't want to reveal anything else about the band yet but I can tell you it's a little on the heavier and noisy side. So send me names. Send me names. We can't come to an agreement. But the songs are sounding great. We're firming everything up. I'm starting to put vocals over everything. I can't wait to get out there and start playing music again because it's been way too long. I think the last live gig I played was in early 2016 in a short-lived but great band I was in called Disappearing. Uh, So yeah, I played bass in that band. I'm playing guitar and singing in this new band. Can't wait. Can't wait to start playing again. Number three, I haven't streamed in a while on Twitch. I got a new super powered PC. I'm moving to a two PC setup. I'm trying to figure out how to connect them through a capture card and get the audio right and run everything through OBS Streamlabs. It's complicated. I'm getting closer. I think I finally have all the equipment that I need. So as soon as I get all that up and running and tested and everything is working great, I will be doing live streams again, starting with Warzone, because it's a fun game and I haven't streamed it in a while. I've been playing through Doom 3 as well, which is okay. It's okay. But uh, more on that when I finish it. And other than that, it's business as usual. Summer is winding down to a close. Fall, my favorite season is coming up. No more hot weather. Nice, cool weather, fall fashion. Hmm? Hmm? I've been building up my fall wardrobe. This is the best time of the year, and I look forward to it every year. So everything is great. Everything is great here, and I hope you're doing great as well. So remember, you can reach out to me anytime through the Instagram, New Scene Pod, or email me at newscenepod at iodinerecords.com. So I'm back Monday with another brand new episode and another brand new guest. I'll talk to you then. Thanks everybody for listening, and until next time.